Hello, hello, hello everyone. Happy April 2nd. It's Tuesday. I am in Cleveland, Ohio. Just got into town, I guess, last night. And uh, haven't been to Cleveland for a while. I haven't been to Cleveland since July of last year. And uh, I'm excited because tomorrow I'm going to be interviewing my really good friend Christopher Milo, who I interviewed last uh, July. He's a guy that has the mohawk, that plays the piano like nobody's business, a uh, concert pianist, and he's played out in Las Vegas, and he has a ministry that he helps people that have had uh, episodes of being bullied. He goes into school systems. He's awesome, great man of God, and uh, we just love to hang around each other because we like to uh, crack each other up. So, And then his wife, Mary Beth, just uh, puts up with us. So anyway... Looking forward to connecting with Christopher tomorrow, and I'm going to uh, give you a quick recap of how things went over the weekend, because yesterday I couldn't. I was interviewing my good friend Darren Canning, and sorry about the uh, echoes that happened. I had no control over that, that uh, sometimes it happens that uh, the people that I interview, like they're phones and the speakers for some reason there's an echo and the only way to circumvent that is to have them wear earbuds and he said he was not able to get the earbuds to work so unfortunately um we had to put up with that and so when i don't talk then you can hear him speaking clearly so um, anyway he was the one that was supposed to be doing most of the talking so it turned out uh, as well as it possibly could so um, but uh, normally when i do my interviews i try to make sure that the people have earbuds available so that way in case there is some echoing and feedback then that gets resolved so anyways um so over the weekend i'm gonna do a quick recap last weekend i was in angola indiana up in northeastern indiana steuben county and um we had a freedom night friday night we had about 165 people that showed up from five different states as far away as Frankfort, Kentucky, which is about a, I think it was about a, almost a five hour drive uh, to Ohio, to Michigan, to Chicago, Illinois, and all places in Indiana. So tremendous, uh, tremendous turnout Friday night. On Saturday, we had a training and equipping. And uh, immediately after Friday night, we had a couple that came up and said that their marriage was saved, which is the whole goal of Restored to Freedom is getting individuals set free so that they can get along in their marriages and not have to go through divorce. And uh, that's just a tremendous uh, victory. We've had several other positive uh, testimonies come out of it. One man, he had pr apparently a uh, pain in his shoulder for several years and that got healed instantly. So that's cool. And then there's a man with a chronic leg pain for a long time and that got healed. And um, I heard yesterday there was a child that was there. I'm not sure, maybe they were nine, 10 years old, something like that. And they got delivered and they were actually doing their homework yesterday. And the parents were just shocked. They were like, oh my gosh, you know, we got our child back. And that's what happens when you get you know, deliverance is you no longer get hearing those loud voices from the enemy telling you to behave badly. <laughs> and so therefore you can be at peace. So that's why it's so important to know and know and discern between the thoughts coming in from the enemy and the thoughts coming in from you and uh, shutting down the enemy's voice. So, and then let's see, Sunday, I was at Fremont Community Church, had great deliverance that morning. And then a group of us from the church went to see the movie Unplanned. My friend Robia Scott's in that. She plays the really bad villain. <laughs> she plays the face of Planned Parenthood. And it was really hard, you know, tough role for her because, you know, she doesn't like to play the evil one. It'd be much easier for her to play the good one because, you know, that's who she is behind closed doors in real life. You know, I've known her for 10 years and she's very loving and caring and very discerning and very prophetically gifted. Her and her husband uh, are awesome team that they make, um, James. So anyway, um, kudos. The movie uh, had double an amount of turnout that they were expecting. And so therefore that, you know, money drives Hollywood, obviously. Money drives these movie theaters. So if people are demanding to watch it, they will open up more theaters. And so they opened up with only like 
I think it was at a thousand fifty movie theaters that showed it. You know, and Dumbo was, for example, in I think uh, what was it four thousand theaters, something like that, or five thousand. So uh, unplanned. Um, if you look at it per uh, dollar amount per movie, it came in third place. Um, because the other movies were in uh, maybe more theaters, so they didn't make as much. They may have made more total dollars, but uh, Unplanned did a great, great job. God did a great job getting it out there because the uh, networks, TV networks, would not allow it to be promoted on ABC, NBC, CBS. So this is all pretty much word of mouth through Facebook and through God and the Holy Spirit. So they've opened up 700 more theaters. They're going to be showing it in the United States this weekend. So we will be up to 1,800 movie theaters across the U.S. Uh, I'm not sure when it's going to be shown in Canada and outside of the United States, but um, uh, for those that are in the United States, that's a, it's going to be awesome to watch and see what happens because they don't know what to do with this. This is truth. This is an ugly truth that is going on behind these Planned Parenthood clinics where these innocent babies are being killed. And uh, it's, it's a hard movie to watch. There were some times I had to look away um, because I was just like, oh my gosh, God, this is so awful. That's an extension really of what the uh, ministry that I'm doing with Restored to Freedom, and that is exposing the evilness of what Jezebel, Satan, um, Leviathan, what it does and how it can lie and how it can manipulate and how it wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Because you think about back in the real Jezebel's days in 1 Kings and 2 Kings, she worshipped Baal, Baal and Moloch, and that was sacrificing babies was a part of that, what the God required. And so they would kill innocent babies. So therefore, that's exactly what this is. It's an extension of Jezebel. Uh, it wants to steal, kill, and destroy God's people and shut, shut us down. So anyway, after all of that, I was pretty spent and was pretty tired. I did not want to do the worldwide deliverance session on Sunday night. I mean, physically, I was just exhausted, but I went ahead and did it, of course, because there was a bunch of people that were going to watch it. Uh, we've so, so far, I've had 2,800 people that have watched it. I think we had 1,700 live that watched it, which is incredible. Great turnout, and so many first-timers that were watching it that got delivered on uh, Sunday night. Again, you can watch it. It's out there. It's posted. And I believe Tina has uploaded it. Yeah, I think she uploaded it late last night. So it's on YouTube now. So you can share it. So very anointed. The people that have watched it said it was probably the most anointed one yet. So far, they continue to seemingly get more anointed every single time we do it. So um, the Worldwide Deliverance, again, watch it. It's powerful. We get rid of Jezebel, Leviathan, Ahab, Legion, A. Um, no, I said Ahab, <laughs> uh, Prekop, witchcraft curses, and uh, a lot of people got healed miraculously, instantaneously, so good stuff. All right, uh, the topic the Lord wanted me to talk about today is trusting God when your circumstances look bad, because a lot of us are in that situation. You know, I was in that myself, and it wasn't fun going through that. Um, you know, in all things, God's ultimate purpose for us is to grow more and become more like Christ into his image, you know, Romans 8, 29. So that's the goal of every Christian, every goal of, of, uh, of the Lord for our lives is to become more Christ-like in everything. So it includes, you know, trials and tribulations. The Bible says we're going to go through this stuff. It's designed to uh, help us to reach that goal of becoming more Christ-like. It's a part of the process of sanctification is going through the fire, going through the stuff that's not fun to go through. You know, we want to be set apart for God's purposes and, and for his glory. So the way trials accomplish this is explained in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, and says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which perishes, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The true believer's faith will be made sure by the trials we experience so that we can rest in the knowledge that is real and will last forever. Trials develop godly character, and that enables us to rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. It does, you know, I mean, I know it myself. I'll tell, you know, we all know that. You know, there's, the enemy will try to come against us with circumstances to try to shut us down, get us to give up, and we press through it. We end up getting out of bed. 
We hear thoughts we get hit by from the enemy. We have people that say things about us, twist things, lie about us, whatever. You know, and we get hurt when we grow up from father wounds and mother wounds, and we can become like Jezebel and hurt other people ourselves. We have to be honest. Um, but we have to fight through that, keep pushing up the mountain. Um, so we know that suffering produces perseverance. Per perseverance develops character. And then character increases our hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Romans 5, 3 through 5. So a lot of times circumstances that we are in will develop fear. And fear is nothing more than I say false evidence appearing real. You know, fear is something the enemy is trying to speak to us in our mind, saying this bad thing could happen, this bad thing could happen. If you don't do this thing, then this bad thing will happen. And so it drives us to where we have no peace in our lives. And I understand that if you are in a relationship with someone that you have no control over them because they have a free will, then that makes it extremely hard with your circumstances. You know, I went through that. I went through six years of extreme stuff that was not fun to go through. I couldn't tell anybody about it. I had to just endure it and go through it and learn from it and gained ultimately an, an extreme anointing in able to speak about it uh, as far as what's going on behind closed doors in a lot of homes throughout the world, like billions of homes and like a lot of Christians are having to endure. And had I not gone through that for that long and endured it, and some people have gone through it longer, you know, some people have had more than knives thrown at them and glasses thrown at them and their, you know, fingernails scarring their arms. They've gone through way more abuse than what I went through. Uh, but I went through some, some stuff that was extreme for me. And um, when I went through all that, I remember that the circumstances looked horrible. You know, all these prophetic words that were spoken over actually both of us back on the first week of, of uh, 2009 about a worldwide ministry. Um, about working with people that have had divorces and children that were m messed up and uh, um, operating in deliverance, which I did not want to do because um, my grandmother did it and she was weird. She was not the way she should have been. She was not at peace. She did not get along with um, many people at all. She had like no friends and uh, didn't want to do deliverance. I didn't want to, you know, I mean, healing was something I didn't know anything about and uh, prophesying I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to do that. So. Those are the things that they had, had all prophesied over me and my wife. And uh, my wife, you know, was getting hit by the enemy throughout the marriage. She kept telling me the enemy was telling her bad things about me. Well, circumstantially, it looked pretty doggone bad. You know, I went into $50,000 worth of debt that I took on from my stepsons, helping them out so that they wouldn't have to take the burden of uh, bills and so forth that they couldn't pay. I ended up paying it for them and taking it on myself. So anyways, um, it was a, a, a challenge going through all that stuff. It was hard. It was not easy. And um, I ended up uh, continuing to have to fight through that. The enemy kind of tried to continue to get me to focus on the circumstances, try to remind me of all that stuff. It wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. And so essentially what I had to do was to simply shut down the enemy's thoughts coming into me and focus on what I knew the Lord was telling me to do. So it's really important. You know, we cannot allow ourselves to listen to an entire sentence from the enemy. Because if you do that, then you are what? You're on the enemy's territory. And he's going to try to get you distracted and get off topic and not be focused on what the Lord has been speaking to you. And so if you let the enemy speak to you over and over, you're going to be a mess. You're not going to be at peace. You're not going to have joy. You're not going to have um, the victorious life the Lord wants you to. Now, again, circumstances that are negative, that are bad, that's going to happen to every one of us. It's how you handle it. Do you get into where you're fearing and worrying and, and you can't go to sleep at night because you keep thinking about it. You keep ruminating about your circumstances, how this will never change. This will never get better. If you keep speaking that out, then you are declaring and putting a curse on your own self, saying, oh my gosh, I'll never be able to do this or that. Well, this will never happen. I'll never come into the ministry. You can't do that. You need to shut your mouth and speak life. And you need to shut down the voice of the enemy speaking to you. So that means redirect your thoughts on something that is true, 
something that is noble, something that is just, something that is lovely, good report. You need to, to focus on that. Do not allow yourself to be tormented by the enemy. And that's what deliverance does. When you get delivered, it's like you've kicked the enemy now outside of your mind, outside of your house. And so now you can discern when those thoughts come in to try to cause you to lose your circumstance or you lose your peace and then you can shut it down and you can uh, speak life. So it's important that you discern and hear the Lord's voice clearly. So if he tells you over and over and confirms for you that this is what's going to happen, then you can endure the circumstances for a season. And the season might be a year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years. You know, it might be, we don't know how long it might be, but as long as you hear clearly from the Lord and you can ask for confirmations, I did that, Lord, you know, am I still on track? Should I change things? You know, should I leave? Should I separate? You know, the Lord said, no, no, I want you to stay in it. Now I stayed in it until the Lord finally said, now it's time to separate, which was six years. And um, I lasted longer than the other three men that, was, that were married to my second wife. They, they lasted five years, two years, and 14 months before they had separated and divorced. And so I didn't want to go through a divorce. I didn't. I separated. And then my ex is the one that actually filed for divorce. And she wouldn't get set free once I realized what it was, the tormenting of Jezebel and Leviathan that was tormenting her. Because why? She had a free will. We don't have authority over our spouses. We cannot kick out demons from them. Now, we can from our children if they're still living in the home, you know, typically 18 and under. We can take authority over that. But again, if we're the ones that have the demons that are tormenting our kids, we have to get ourselves delivered first. You know, that makes sense. So, or if, they're, if we have a spouse that's hurting them, then they may need to distance themselves from them, if at all possible. Um, all right, so that all being said, um, you know, many have received prophetic words saying, this is what's going to happen to you. And you're believing for that and you're standing on it. That's great. You know, continue to stand, continue to ask the Lord for confirmation. Because there's a lot of couples that I uh, have worked with over the years that uh, have said, yeah, we were pro prophesied that we together were going to have this ministry, working um, in ministry together. But what happens is one of the spouses is dealing with the spirit of Jezebel and Leviathan, stronger than the other spouse normally. The other one's normally got Ahab. And so the person that has Jezebel is not going to cooperate because that spirit wants to stop the prophetic words from manifesting. So therefore, the challenge is going to be, okay, how long do I persist because the demonic spirit in them is going to stop you from the calling the Lord has in your own life? So you have to listen to the Lord clearly. The Lord may have you stay that the person may get delivered, um, but there may be cases where the Lord says, okay, listen, I gave them time to repent. They refused to. Now I'm calling you out to separate. And when you separate, this is like their final chance. Either they listen and they do what the Lord's telling them to do, and that is to repent, to uh, humble themselves, and then choose, choose to forgive those that hurt them and get delivered. Then you can go on together and doing ministry. But in some cases, the Lord say, okay, you've been in this situation for a year or two years. Some of them, it could be a few months if that person's very strongly affected by Jezebel. And the Lord may say, hey, it's time to separate. And then at that point, you got, you got a chance here you know, a person that's being affected by these spirits, time to get delivered. And if they won't, the Lord will say, okay, now it's time to move on. You know, so God doesn't like divorce, obviously. He hates it. I always say, get delivered, not divorced. If two parties both get delivered, then there's no need for divorce because you won't be striving, fighting, arguing, and so forth. But it's important because a lot of couples out there have been prophesied. And then the person that has Ahab will stay in that relationship and they're like, oh my gosh, it's been 10 years. I've gone through more hell. I feel like I'm going to die. <laughs> because that's what happens is Jezebel wants to kill its prey. That's why Elijah ran into the cave and said, Lord, kill me. I want out of here. I want to die. Because um, the Jezebel spirit wants to stop us from our callings. And so it's important to listen to the Lord, ask for signs, ask for confirmations. And then if it's time to separate, the Lord will confirm it for you. Because the Lord doesn't want us to come under a demon and to obey the demon. He wants us to obey God. So we have to obey God first and put our spouse second. It's so important. You know, I know it was hard for me because we had these prophetic words very strong and I didn't want to give up on it. And the Lord finally ultimately, ultimately told me, who are you serving, Nelson? Are you serving your wife? Are you serving me? You, you know, 
you need to choose me first, and then I will deal with your wife. And so I chose to serve God. I listened to God. I did what he told me to do. He said, it's time to separate. That was January 23rd, 2015. He told me that the ministry would, he would set it up through me. It would grow rapidly around the world. People would know about it. And at the time, circumstantially, like, no way, that's not going to happen. You know, I was working for a guy that was a Jezebel, um, a new startup company, software company. Um, I was attending a church with my uh, wife where the pastor had Jezebel and Leviathan. And then my wife was dealing with it. So I had three dealing with it. So the circumstances looked really bad when I separated. Like nothing was going to materialize out of this. And then the, and then the pastor actually ultimately encouraged her to divorce me. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I didn't do anything but love her. The way Christ loved the church, he told me that's how, what I was going to do beforehand. And I did. I did. I really did. And um, it wasn't good enough. But the Lord's like, they have free will. They can choose. And I'm like, well, then they need to choose to get delivered. And he's like, yeah, that's what they should choose. But I give them that option. I give you the option, too. Do you want to serve me? You know, or do you want to serve man? And I'm like, well, I want to serve you. And I'm going to choose you. And so when I did that, then the Lord started to slowly develop the ministry. But it took, I mean, it was like a good... Um, Time I separated, well, it was a couple months later, I guess, that I started actually doing individual deliverance sessions. Um, and then it was about a year after that that I wrote my first book. And then I started traveling to do ministry about six months after that. Eight, or actually, it was almost, yeah, almost two years after I separated that I started actually traveling to Dallas and North Carolina and then uh, California. And then it birthed. And I had some books the Lord had me write. And uh, so the circumstances up to that look like there's no way it was going to, and of course the enemy's trying to speak to me saying, this will never happen. And of course I'm battling those that have Jezebel in leadership in the churches. And so a lot of them are resistant to wanting me to come to their church because they want to keep their good thing going with the demonic spirits ruling them. So it was an uphill battle. You know, oftentimes I had to go into home groups because there were people there that would receive me or I'd go on Facebook Live and do it. So ultimately, um, what we had to do, what I had to do was to not look on the existing circumstances and not speak into those circumstances. The guy that mentored me said, Nelson, I don't want to hear anything negative. You know, he didn't know. He didn't know. I didn't tell him anything. And so I couldn't. And, and that was a good thing to do because a lot of us will want to tell all the horrible things we're going through to somebody and if we do that, um, they're going to give us advice that may not be what God's telling us to do. Like I had a lot of, eventually after a, several years, I did a, 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 a sozo session with a person from a large ministry. And um, they told me, well, God would never have you stay in that relationship. That's abusive. And I'm like, the Lord told me, no, I want you to stay in it. And it was like another, I think it was a year and four months before the Lord finally said, okay, now you're done. Now you're ready to separate. So you have to listen to the Lord clearly. If there's a person that actually is giving you a word from the Lord and you can trust them, then make sure you confirm it to make sure that's what the Lord's telling you. Because in some cases, if, if you go to a bunch of people and God's telling you something other than that, go with what God's telling you. It's so important to listen to the Lord. So I'm going to read in Genesis about Joseph. Because Joseph gives a great example of how, remember, he was uh, given a dream how his brothers were going to bow down to him. Of course, he might probably made a little mistake by telling them that dream. You have to be careful the dreams that you expose because sometimes those dreams might cause people to be jealous and angry about you. And he probably should have kept his mouth shut. But after he shared the dream, what did that do? The brothers got jealous. How dare you? You know, you little punk, <laughs> you little punk kid. We're going to sell you. And, and well, they wanted to kill him at first because the demons in his brothers were so angry getting him mad and so instead of that they you know they were going to put him in a they did they put him in like a hole in the ground and then they ended up selling him to the people that took him to Egypt so I'm going to read about what happens when he was taken to Egypt and then what happens thereafter it's just a cool story um, that's true and uh, the circumstances looked really 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 bad so here we go this is Genesis 39 I'm going to get a drink I'm thirsty all right, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, 
captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. And that's important. You know, when you're doing what you're supposed to do in your life, <clears throat> now the Lord's with you. Doesn't mean that your circumstances aren't going to get worse. Oftentimes, if you get a prophetic word spoken to you, things will go worse <laughs> for you. And if you have a really powerful ministry the Lord's going to take you into, and you've not gone through some of the testing and the trials and the circumstances that look bad, then you may have to go through a lot more hell before you get in to the greatness of the pr prophetic words to have them manifest. So understand that. <clears throat> you know, if you're going to be uh, managing multi-million dollars, then oftentimes the Lord takes away all the money that you have, which he did to me, took it all away. And I had to trust him for pennies every day for a while, like a couple of years. You know, I still have debt that I've taken on from my stepchildren, uh, my stepsons, and uh, I'm still paying that back, you know. And, and the Lord's like, doesn't matter how big it is, if it's 50000 70000 which is what it was. And the Lord's like, no worries. You know, I can pay it off in a second, or I may have you pay it off over time. But don't worry. It's just a temporary circumstance. Because <clears throat> circumstances change it, change. All right, so the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and he served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. So he trusted Joseph for everything. Favor, 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 awesome, great things. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So apparently the girls liked him and thought he was cute. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Oh my goodness, he, I think she wanted to like have sex with him. Well, that's not right. You know, hello, you've got Potiphar. That's your husband. You know, you can't do that. So what did Joseph do? Joseph have sex? No, he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day. So the enemy oftentimes wants to wear us down. You know, the first time someone tries to come in and tries to tempt you, uh, to sin. Maybe that you can resist it, but then by the fifth or sixth or tenth time, after it's been a couple of weeks, you may give in. So we have to be very careful to guard that. Um, so day by day, he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside. Now that's important right there to understand. There was no one there. So oftentimes, people that operate in Jezebel, they will target you to have a private conversation or an act or whatever to accuse you of things because there's no one else to validate what the truth is. That's why it's important if you're dealing with people that are you know, hearing the voice of the enemy, very demonic, to have another person with you, almost, if you need, if you have to at all times. Now I know it's a challenge when you're married to someone that has that. But if you're like working with somebody in the church, it'd be nice to have someone with you because if you don't, they can lie, they can twist, they can cause things to be said that were false. False accusations, sometimes false accusations are like, uh, you know, oftentimes people that have Jezebel, that's how, what will bring down a ministry, is they can falsely accuse you of something and nothing ever happened. But if people believe the lies and that can twist and, and turn and cause people to lose ministries, to hurt ministries, hurt churches, and so forth. So anyway, 
So it was, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened, when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought us came in to me to mock me. So it happened, as I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So she lied. She lied. That's exactly what Jezebels do, obviously, is to lie, twist, manipulate, falsely accuse, and um, create circumstances that are bad, really, really bad. So in this case, if people buy into a lie about you, you could have circumstances that can change, and you didn't do anything wrong. You were serving God, doing what God wanted you to do, and it just takes one word from someone. But what happens is that you need to then trust God completely with your circumstances. They may look bad, but guess what? God knows the truth. He knows what he's doing. He knows that you may have to go through something very hard, uh, someone that accuses you of something horrible, and, and then gets others to believe it, to come against you, to try to shut you down and hurt you. So in this case, what happened? It says... Uh, then Joseph's, um, oh, uh, so it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. So again, it was based upon a lie. So what happened? Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But... The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So basically, whatever might happen to you circumstantially, if someone comes against you, falsely accuses you, lies about you, makes your circumstances look bad. Maybe you might lose your job. Maybe you might uh, uh, no longer have the position in church that you deserve to have. Maybe you're a pastor and you were lied about by a person with Jezebel and it costs you half of your um, tithers, you know, they're gone. And so now, like, what do I do? Uh, oh my gosh, you know, and people are questioning, gee, what's truth, what's a lie? Uh, it's not fun, but the Lord, he knows the truth. And if you've done what you're supposed to do, he will oftentimes show you favor in the tough circumstances so that you can trust him completely, no matter what. And, but make sure you guard the thoughts coming in from the enemy into your mind. Because if you start to allow the enemy's thoughts to come in and you buy them as truth, you will not be at peace. You'll be in worry. You'll be in fear. You'll be in anger. So take every thought captive, like it says in 2 Corinthians. Take every thought captive and discern what's coming from the enemy. Okay, but the Lord was with Joseph, showed him mercy, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. How cool is that? The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because he was a good guy. He, know, he knows it. But they'll say this, there's oftentimes um, people that know the truth and they don't believe the lies, but you're going through circumstances anyway. Like oftentimes you may have a spouse that's lying about you and yet their own children if you got remarried to somebody, that their own children know the truth of who you really are and they want to be your friend and they want to love on you. You know, I've had that happen in my own situation. You know, I still have a relationship, you know, with my stepson and it's a great thing, you know. Uh, he knows the truth. So, anyways. So, the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So no matter what you're in, and it could be financially, that your circumstances look awful and horrible. You know, I went through it where I didn't have any extra money for a long time, and it was hard. It was extremely hard because I'm like, Lord, I didn't do anything, didn't do anything that was bad or wrong. And I'm like, why am I having to suffer for this? And he's like, well, it's just for a season. You know, I'm humbling completely the pride out of you. It's got to go. 
100%. And, and, and maybe that, you know, I'd, I'd already gotten humbled quite a bit, but I got even humbled more. You know, I had to give plasma, I had to give my blood. So someone's out there, <laughs> my blood's in their body. How amazing, how cool is that? You know, I had to humble myself to do that, to make $75 a week so that I could buy some groceries for myself or I could uh, get some gas so I could go to work and score these tests for $14 an hour. You know, in the meantime, I was writing books to start the ministry, to birth it. So anyways, I'm gonna go on and read Genesis 40. It says, it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their Lord, the king of Egypt. You don't want to offend the king of Egypt or a king. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them. So they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded. Its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of the dream. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to their place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me. Now please help me get out of here is what he wanted. Remember me when it was well with you, and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. Get me out of jail. So oftentimes, you may have someone that reaches out to you, and you're put in a position to where you help them. You go above and beyond, you know, you're suffering, you're in horrible circumstances and someone comes to you and you end up helping them out because God wants us to have a servant's heart no matter whether you are suffering in, in the greatest ways imaginable. He wants us to always have the heart to help someone, to have the servant's heart at all times, no matter if they can help you or not. You know, in this case, that person could help him. So of course he's wanting them to remember so um so but remember me when it is well with you and please show kindness to me make mention of me to pharaoh and get me out of this house for indeed i was stolen away from the land of the hebrews and also i have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good he said to joseph hey i also was in my dream and there were three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So Jason, Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of that dream. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. I'm pretty sure he was not expecting that as the interpretation for his dream. And he was probably like, I don't want that. Uh, <laughs> so Joseph, um, after he said that, says, Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. He lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So, we're still supposed to, obviously, try, no matter what the circumstances look like, to speak life, to be positive, not to go negative, not to complain, not to be the uh, 
um, the uh, <laughs> um, Israelites that are in the uh, desert where they all died out because they're complaining. So no matter what your circumstances are, try to resist at all possible speaking into them. In fact, I just saw, I know saw Rabia that had jumped on here. Not sure if she still is on here or not, but Rabia and I had the same um, mentor. And he would always say, do not speak into the circumstances. Do not speak into the circumstances, which meant I don't want to hear anything negative that you're going through. Zip it. Speak life. And that's it. You know, because you, do, you don't want to speak, oh my gosh, I've got, you know, this going on, that bad thing going on, and da 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 You know, just go through it because you're getting stronger. There's nobody that gets stronger by taking weight off of their bar, their barbell. They get stronger by lifting more, and they get more and more strength. So in the spirit realm, when you're going through these trials and tribulations and circumstances, count it all joy. I know a lot of people on Facebook, they like the, you know, I'm going through this hell, this is horrible, please feel sorry for me, you know, or pray for me. You know, I'll, I went through it for six years, I not, didn't ask one person to pray for me. Not one person knew, and it was hard. Because oftentimes I would go out to eat with my children and I couldn't let them know because my spouse was being nice to me in front of the children. She was actually nice to my children too. Um, but uh, my brother went out to lunch with once and he's like, oh, you know, I, I, everything in me wanted to say, mm, I'm going through bad things and it's not like it, it appears, but I couldn't. So it was really hard, you know, so, so my mentor, I couldn't tell him. And it wasn't until, I think it was maybe six years later, that finally um, he told me, he said, Nelson, he goes, you're going to be extremely, 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 extremely anointed. I'm like, how many extremely? He said, but you're going to have to go through some extreme, 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 extreme stuff. And I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, I know what that means. <laughs> so anyways, again, count it all joy when you are going through various trials and tribulations, knowing that this is all going to be working out for the good as long as you commit yourself to enduring it and not saying this is too hard i'm leaving and uh, i'm not going to go through with it again the lord will take you through the season it'll be a season doesn't mean your entire life if you if you serve a jezebel spouse your entire life and then die when you're 60 or 50 um what good was that there's got to be purpose in the pain and that purpose is a stronger anointing when you actually endure it for a season all right now genesis 41 this is the last I will read. It says, Then it came to pass at the end of two full years. Two years he had to go through being in jail. Two years. That's a long time. Two years. <laughs> two years in jail. That Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. In fact, some people say I think it was three years that he was there. So it might have been two years after this all took place, if it's in chronological order. So he could have been in jail for the first year and then had the interpretation of the dreams for the butler and the baker, but not the candlestick maker. So <laughs> then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time. And suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed, it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt. Um, not good. All the sorcerers, all the uh, witches and warlocks. So all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. Finally, really? Two years later? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Joseph's probably saying. <sighs> so he says, I remember my faults this day when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night, he and I. 
Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there. Oh yes, now it's all coming back. <laughs> Joseph's like, really? You want to slap him? <laughs> <laughs> Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his dream. Now, there's a young man with us there, servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him. He interpreted our dream as for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream, and it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us. So it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. Hello? Hey, would you like to bring up Joseph? Yes. That man from three years ago? <laughs> He's still down there in the dungeon, enjoying life amongst the prisoners. So uh, they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved. Just think he hadn't shaved for like three years. Long beard, I'm sure, probably. Well, I think his age was, I think he was 30 years old at this time. So um, anyway, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke. Also I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. good. Then behold, seven heads, withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land, so the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. Can you imagine at that point in time, you know, Joseph's giving him this, you know, great idea. like, you should appoint somebody that's pretty smart, that's really wise, discerning. <laughs> He's probably thinking, uh, <laughs> pointing at himself. <laughs> Me, I could be that guy. Hello! <laughs> you just imagine that. So, the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Hmm, can we find such a one as this? A man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Joseph's like, Yes! Finally! <laughs> Three years! <sighs> and Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. 
and he had him ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Joseph's probably like, dang, <laughs> when all that came down. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Pania. And after all of that, he gave him as a wife. He gave him a wife. What a deal. He gets to be number two in command underneath Pharaoh of all the land, and he gets a wife. Hopefully she doesn't have Jezebel, because that would be a bad thing. <laughs> so, he gave him as a wife, Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old. Yep, he was 30. When he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. So bam, suddenly just like that, you know? And so that's why it's so important not to complain when we're going through circumstances. Count it all joy, all the various trials and sufferings and false accusations and crap that you have to go through, you know? And try to limit and zip your mouth and, and, and speaking that to your friends and family, you know? Just say, okay, this is between me and God. I can do this, I can go through this. This is gonna make me stronger all these things, you know, and it does. You know, there's things that I'm going through. I go through, I'm gonna go through more things. It'll be even more challenging, you know. You know, my friend Robia, I don't know if he's still on her or not, but Robia, you know, was accused of some things with this movie coming out. And like, uh, you know, she's just like that and her, her character is just like that in real life. You know, I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, can you imagine going through false accusations? Well, some false accusations are really, really, really bad and really hard to hear. You're like, and you want to defend yourself, you know, and, and in case of here, you know, here's, here's Joseph that's in the dungeon, you know, who's going to defend himself to the people in prison. They'll be like, yeah, right. I'm sure you didn't do that. Like, he's like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you know, he's not getting a fair trial. Oftentimes you're not going to get a fair trial. You're going to be accused of something circumstantially and it's going to hurt you. I've, I've talked to some people that have lost their church because of people that have lied, that have had the Jezebel spirit. That people that have lost their marriages, oftentimes I'll say this too, people that operate in Jezebel, they will lie, 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 we know that, um, and that's what they, their intentions are to do, but oftentimes they will be the ones filing for divorce because the person that has Ahab wants to help them get set free, they have a mercy heart, but the Jezebels will lie about them, file for divorce, accuse them of horrible things, even maybe do protective orders that are all completely made up and false. That's how evil, wicked that Jezebel spirit is. And then they'll trash their reputation. And so oftentimes the person has to like move away, get away and start over again. Just like, oh, this is not good. So anyways, anytime you're going through circumstances, just say, hey, listen, it's par for the course. It's gonna make me stronger. I'm gonna become more like Christ. It's gonna be a good thing. And don't listen to the enemy. When the enemy is trying to speak to you, shut him down. Think about the thoughts that you're having and shut Shut it off. Don't let them speak a sentence to you. Don't let them get the entire sentence in. If you do that, you're gonna be angry, taking an offense, mad, you know, not good. I had, I had to take every thought captive. Literally, when I was going through my stuff, it was like, the enemy would try to hit me with things. And I'm like, no, I'm gonna stop it, like mid-sentence. And then before I knew, I started getting to stop him like after three words or four words. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna let that thought come in. I'm gonna keep it outside my brain and think about things that are true, noble, just. I'm gonna speak out what the Lord told me. You know, I had to speak out. The Lord told me I'm gonna have a ministry working with people around the world. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know it was gonna be a deliverance of Jezebel, and Leviathan, and Ahab, and Legion, and witchcraft, but that's what, it's, what it is, because it's a part, 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 of, part of getting the church pure and spotless. And it's hard, it's not easy. And it was hard to go through this. Um, and it's still, you know, not easy traveling, going all over the place, you know, um, by myself and not sure where I'm going to be here or there, where, wherever. So anyways, um, count it all joy. So tomorrow my guest is the one and only Christopher Milo. He's the guy with the mohawk. 
and uh, he plays like a piano like better than Liberace did. Uh, he actually was in uh, Las Vegas in the past where he actually performed you know there in one of the big hotels and uh, he's amazing a awesome concert pianist it's just amazing 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 and he's funny and he can play journey so so I'm going to basically uh, interview him tomorrow I can't wait because I've not seen him for like since July of last year you know and we, we connected so well um, he made me laugh I made him laugh we sang journey songs you know we had fun we hung out so this is going to be a great interview, and I will have him play some concert songs. I'll have him play some Christian songs. I'll have him play some 80s songs, some Journey songs. And uh, his ministry is growing. He talks about uh, being bullied, and he goes into the school systems. He's also RTF certified, so he's helping people get delivered, too. He's passing my books, Restore to Freedom, out, helping people get set free. So him and his wife, Mary Beth, and guess what? Mary Beth has world-famous brisket that's made in a different way than I guess nobody's ever made before so I'm gonna have brisket tomorrow night I had it actually Saturday night um, uh, with my good friend Trina Weisel after we did this ministry um, this past weekend we had a group of us that came over and it was awesome I love brisket um, so anyways um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Friday Friday night I will be in Canada Gonna be in Canada for like 24 hours. <laughs> Gonna go up uh, on Friday um, at the Prayer Center in St. Catharines in Ontario at 7 p.m. doing a Freedom Night Friday night, and that's just real close to uh, Niagara Falls. And um, maybe we can do like a uh, a baptism. Yes, in the falls. That would be so cool. Um, Saturday we're doing training from 10 to 3, getting people certified on Restored to Freedom. And then I'm coming back out of Canada, back into the United States, driving as far as I can, as close as I can get to Iowa, because I gotta be there Sunday night. Gonna be Sunday night in Fort Atkinson, Iowa at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. <sighs> April 9th, I'll be in Appleton, Wisconsin with my good friend Kel Bales. And then I'll be with Patricia Wolf in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, April the 10th. I'll be in Gillette, Wyoming with Danelle Powell and her husband. Um, and that's April 12th and 13th, so that's next weekend. I'll be in Wyoming. Maybe I can see some buffalo and bison and some uh, wildlife, bears and things like that. And then there's a church I'm going to be going to. I'm not sure the name of the church yet. I think it's going to be April 14th. And then some other place I'm going to be at there, I think, on Tuesday. And then April 18th, I'll be at the Healing Rooms in Gillette, Wyoming. This has just all got scheduled in the last few hours. And then I'm also going to be in Douglas, Wyoming, April the 23rd. So it's blowing up. And it's awesome because people like you and me that never did ministry before are doing ministry now. And God's using us, those that have gotten our hearts healed, restored, and our pride kicked out, and our humility coming in so that we can help people get set free and get them delivered and change this world, get billions delivered before Christ comes back. So... Alrighty, um, it has almost been an hour and I'm getting hungry and so no words today for people. So um, tomorrow again, Christopher Milo, he's awesome, I can't wait, he's my buddy. And they have these pygmy goats, I think they still have them there, named Mr. Milo, Milo and Charlie Brown. So maybe I'll take you outside you can see the pygmy goats again and they can do their weird bars that they do or whatever their <laughs> whatever their voices look like sound like so all right see you guys later bye yeah bye